Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of our slash tales from tech support. In today's episode. You. You are the reason the work on your computer hasn't started. That time I brought my A game, accumulated respect points and up leveled as a result. Before we get started make sure to subscribe so you will never miss a video. So let's get started. You. You are the reason the work on your computer hasn't started. I was reminded of this story recently, but it happened about six or seven years ago. I was working for the tech services section of a prominent big box retailer with blue shirts. I was working a morning shift that day so in at 9 a.m. I had checked in a lady that morning for some issues 9 am with her laptop. Now the way this works is I spend 10 to 15 minutes with the client to get an understanding of what the problem is, and then create the service order. When the computer gets checked in it gets flagged for diags or eval. Eval is for when the computer either cannot turn on or cannot connect to the network. That was not the issue with this computer. Which meant her computer was flagged for diags. When a computer is flagged for diags, it gets plugged into the network and remote tech starts the battery of software diags on it. Depending on the condition of the computer the diags can take between 4 and 12 hours. So it's 4 to 12 hours and then someone actually goes to work on it. I told the client that right now we were looking at a 2 to 3 day turnaround, I like to under promise. So there's an open connection, I slide it in, connect the cables and queue it up. Typically someone will start the diags in 15 to 30 minutes at that point. So the client got checked in at like 10 or 10.30 in the morning. For in the afternoon she calls in wanting to know why we haven't started on her laptop. Okay, it's a bit odd but not totally unheard of. She may have simply assumed we hadn't started since we haven't called. So I go back and check. And yet diags aren't running. It's also no longer queued. Someone may have moved the laptop and interrupted the connection, or the computer charger lost connection or something. It happens sometimes. I apologize for the delay, make a note and confirm that it is queued up, the connections are tight, and that it is flagged for diags, and ready to go, and that a tech should be starting the diags any time now. Just to make sure there isn't a problem I ping the tech line and ask them to confirm the unit is queued. They can see and it's in line to be started, should be started in about 5 minutes. Finish out my shift, leave for the day. I come back the next day. First call of the day, same lady wanting to know why we haven't started work on their computer. Okay. This is somewhat unusual. I go and look at her computer. And it is no longer queued and don't have any diagonal results. Okay. So something is going on. I once more apologize to the client, explain that something atypical is going on, and I am going to look into it. I re ping the tech line, confirm they can see it, that it is responding to the ping request, and ask them to prioritize the diags on it so I can personally confirm that the diags have been started. Pull a few strings, and I get it to go through. I see the diags starting. I make a note of the time and the service order. Okay, good to go. I go back to the counter. Rest of my shift goes off without issue, and I leave for the day. I come back the next day, and there is a message from the client, who is absolutely livid that we still haven't started work on her system. Wav T. I'm trying to figure out how she got that impression. If she called after I left, the other members of the department would have told her that the diags were running, or were done, and what the results were. I personally saw the diag started, so I know they got started. I go to look at the computer fully expecting to see a nice detailed multi-page diags report all set to contact the client and find out what, there is nothing. The diags were not finished. It's no longer Q. There are no notes on the service order. What? The. Hell? I ping tech line and ask for the access log on that connection. Okay, it lost the connection about 4.30 the afternoon before. Ugh. That means the diags were running for over 6 hours, but didn't finish, otherwise, I could view the report. 
I call the client back, apologize for the delay, explain that I personally saw the diag started and something knocked the computer off the connection about 6 hours later. Given that the computer has now been here for 48 hours it is now a priority ticket. So I grab one of the techs, explain the situation, and tell them I want to set the laptop up on the desktop shelf so the techs can keep an eye on it. We move it, set it up, requiet, ping the tech line again, explain that it's now a priority, get the diags rolling on it. Make a note of it in the service order. And we go about the rest of our day. 2.15 rolls around and the tech flags me down and explains that he just saw the laptop drop the connection and switch to a remote desktop connection. As we're looking at the computer we see someone is accessing the computer and the remote software has knocked off our remote connection. Almost on cue the phone rings, I answer it. It's the client. Who is livid that we still have not started work on her computer? Ma'am, do you use remote desktop software on your computer? I ask. Yes. It's how I know you morons haven't started work on my computer. She shrieks in the phone. And you were just using it to look at your computer, I presume? I ask. Yes. Why? She demands. And you used it yesterday about 4.30, I'm guessing. I ask. What difference does that make? She asks. I'm just trying to figure out what it is that keeps preventing us from completing the first step in the repair process. Did you use it about 4.30 yesterday? I ask a bit more sternly. Yes. I guess it was about then. She finally concedes. Aha. Uh -huh. Please hold for just a minute. I put her on hold and ask the tech how she could be accessing the computer through the remote desktop when our network is isolated. He ponders it for a moment and thinks the laptop could be connecting to the public Wi-Fi. I ask him to get TechLine to launch the Diag software, he does so while I go to disable the wireless adapter. Normally when we launch the diagram system it disables all the other network connections, but the Ethernet connection, unless we tell it to test those connections. Apparently, it wasn't doing that this time. I nod and go back to the customer. Alright ma'am, I need your help with something real quick. Would you please try to access your computer via your remote desktop software? I ask. What are you doing? Why aren't you working on my computer, she demands. Yes ma'am. I am testing a theory about why we have not been able to complete the work on your computer. Would you please try to access your computer via your remote desktop software? I explain. Fine. She sighs. A moment or two go by. What the hell? I can't access it now. What did you do? It was working just a few minutes ago. What did you do? You have to fix it now. She starts shrieking. Yes ma'am. Your remote desktop software was interrupting our diagnostic software and crashing the process forcing us to start over a process that looks to take about 8 or 9 hours to complete. I explain. What do you mean? She demands. We have started the diagnostic process four times now. Three of those times you have accessed your computer with your remote desktop software and broke our connection to our diagnostics. To be blunt, you are the reason that we have been unable to complete our diagnostics on your computer. Now that I have disabled your wireless adapter, your computer is no longer connected to the internet allowing us to do the work you have asked us to do. Because your computer has been here for more than 48 hours it is now a priority ticket. With that being said, we are still looking at 8 to 12 hours to finish the diagnostics and to identify the problem, and then we can fix the problem. So the estimated turnaround time at this point is 24 hours. I explained. The problem with her computer was she had two pieces of malware that the automatic repairs which are the last step of the diags dealt with. So if she had just not used the remote desktop system, it would have been done that first morning. That time I brought my A-game, accumulated respect points and up-leveled as a result. After recounting three occasions that I behaved like G.O.B., one of which almost ended in tears, another that saw me break the law, and I thought I did well and the third in which I did actually RTFM, 
but ignored what it said, I decided to write of a time when I was a newbie all over again, but came out looking good. This is long, even by my standards, and my penchant for esoteric verbiage. Read it or don't read it, it's no skin off my nose. My form of tech support is aircraft maintenance, working on fixed-wing aeroplanes and helicopters with a value ranging from mid-five figures to mid-eight figures. They usually can be divided into airborne aluminium pit ponies or their owner's pride and joy. Even a business jet worth more than $10 million can be treated as a workhorse, while a 45-year-old $40,000 bugs masher may be pampered by its owner. Lo these many years ago, and with the best part of two decades in the game, I had recently started working line maintenance asterisk for an airline that had two different types of aircraft in its fleet, one of which I was very familiar with, Type A, and the other of which I had never touched before except for one flight as a passenger, Type B. This lack of experience was no big deal as far as I was concerned by that point in my career I had already worked on more than a hundred different types of aircraft, and they were all unfamiliar the first time. So, although Type B was new to me, I had plenty of experience that I could extrapolate from, and I was completely unfazed by the state of play. Most of my new colleagues were in opposite land, they had only ever worked for this airline, and had only ever worked on these two types of aircraft. This gave rise to the situation that some of the younger guys knew a lot about the specifics of these aircraft, but hadn't been in the game for even half as long as I had and hadn't seen all that I had seen in terms of nasty little problems. Nevertheless, I was the new guy and I was in an odd position bottom of the pecking order as a by and large unknown quantity, but with a lot more overall experience than some of the guys higher up the informal totem pole. All of this meant that I spent a disproportionate amount of time working on the Type A fleet while the others worked on Type B aeroplanes. There was an ongoing problem with one particular Type B aircraft, one of its propellers would auto-feather at random, usually at rather inopportune moments. This had been going on for weeks and the system had had the bejesus troubleshot out of it over that time, all of the electrical bits had been changed some several times, IIRC even the propeller had been changed once. Pretty much every man and his dog had been involved except your correspondent, who was looking on at all of this and wondering what the frack were these new colleagues of mine doing. This being an airline and line maintenance, there was sometimes a tendency for the workflow to proceed along the lines of Aircraft flies in. Pilot reports dollar problem. Engineer frantically pokes and prods, while there is much wailing and gnashing of teeth and rending of garments, and everyone screams at her slash him hurry up there's a heap of passengers waiting we live and die by the on time performance statistics we can't he have a delay. Engineer changes dollar box, does paperwork as the packs board the aircraft and hopes dollar problem is fixed. Aircraft blasts off into the wide blue yonder slash murk slash darkness, strike out whichever is not applicable, as engineer curses the teeth gnashing garment rending whalers and questions her slash his life choices, packs sit in aluminium tube with drinks and nibbles assuming that everything is hunky-dory, because aviation is safe and it's best not to think about how unnatural all this flying palaver actually is. This tendency was very much in evidence during this whole saga. Technical information, Autofeather is a system on a turboprop aircraft that is meant to reduce the pilot workload when an engine fails, conversely, it increases said workload if a propeller autofeathers when it shouldn't. You want the propeller to feather so there is less drag, air resistance, if it happens automatically that's less for the pilot to worry about while dealing with the engine failure. If you see a turboprop aircraft sitting parked at an airport and the propeller blades are aligned with their flat sides parallel with the fuselage, it probably has auto feather. The propeller is said to be feathered when its blades are at this angle. The angle of the propeller blades is dictated by an ongoing battle inside the propeller hub between a spring and oil under pressure. No oil pressure equals spring moves the blades into feather. This is why the propellers are feathered on most turboprops when the engines aren't running. Turboprops are rated at X amount of horsepower, because aviation is stuck using American units of measure, but usually what is actually being measured is not horsepower, but the amount of torque at some point in the propeller gearbox. The torque signal might take the form of oil that varies in pressure proportional to the power of the engine, that is fed directly to a gauge in the cockpit, or to a pressure transducer that converts this oil pressure to an electrical signal, or of a strain gauge electrical sensor that sends a signal to where it needs to go. 
On the Type B aircraft, the torque signal is generated by a strain gauge and is used both for the torque indicator and the auto feather system. Briefly, if the auto feather system is switched on and the torque signal voltage falls below a certain value, i.e. the engine is at abnormally low power, the auto feather system will open a valve to dump the pressurized oil out of the propeller hub and the propeller will feather. As mentioned above, my colleagues had been changing auto feather and also torque indicating system components left, right and center without fixing this intermittent problem, they'd even changed the torque gauge, which is akin to changing the speedometer on your car because it doesn't read anything when you've stomped on the brake pedal and locked all of the wheels up, fun fact a typical car speedometer doesn't measure speed, it measures drivetrain revolutions, you could do a burnout and the speedometer will show a speed even though the car is just sitting there with smoke pouring from its tires. But I digress. The problem had happened for the umpteenth time and the aircraft was grounded, with instructions that it really needs to be fixed this time. Which is where I came in, finally, you say. There was a gaggle of avionics guys, including yours truly, poring over the wiring diagram for the system due to the situation described above, I really hadn't been involved up to that point, other than the odd hey Gert, go and help, colleague, change, part, on, aircraft registration. We were discussing how everything had been changed and swapped between aircraft, and the fault was always on the same side on this particular aircraft, and it always happened when the pilot reduced power for landing. More looking at the wiring diagram ensued and all of a sudden, I knew what the problem was. The diagram showed that the auto feather signal wire was spliced to the torque gauge signal wire. The splice was downstream of just about everything in the two systems, yet the unwanted auto feathers were happening while there were no anomalous indications on the torque gauge. Me points to the wiring diagram, there's something wrong with that splice. The signal voltage for the auto feather is dropping because of high resistance, while the resistance of the torque gauge part of the circuit is fine. Colleagues, naysaying and skepticism. Me. Everything has been changed so often that we've proved it's not a box, component, problem, it's indicating fine, there are no fluctuations on the torque gauge. All that's left is this splice. Colleagues, noises indicating somewhat grudging acceptance that the new guy might be onto something. We came up with a plan of action. The aircraft was due to go into heavy maintenance at other city a couple of days hence. Two of the other avionics guys with me that day often went there because the aviation industry is always short of avionics guys and they like to clean up getting big overtime dollars. The aircraft was released to fly to other city and once there it was gutted, my colleagues went to other city and got to work under the aircraft's cabin floor, going through wiring looms as big as my arm, all white wires, none of that fancy dancy color coding in aviation, thank you, until they found the splice, p slash no. D43637, consisting of a small metal barrel 1 cm long and a couple of mm in diameter, covered by a heat shrunk blue plastic sleeve. They didn't even replace it, they just squeezed it with a pair of judiciously applied side cutters, the appropriate crimping tool. The auto feather system never commanded an unnecessary auto feather again. My new colleagues realized that I knew a thing or two. TLDR, we simply could not function without his tireless efforts. So, a round of applause for this inanimate carbon rod. Asterisk in airline world, there are two types of maintenance, line maintenance and heavy maintenance. If you are sitting in an airport terminal and you look outside and see someone changing a wheel on an aircraft or looking at its engine, that's line maintenance. Heavy maintenance is scheduled maintenance and takes place in a hangar out of sight, it could go as far as gutting the interior and pulling up the floor and removing all of the access panels from the wings etc. to have a look in all of the nooks and crannies.